This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. Tactical nuclear weapons, much in the news these last 18 months for war in Ukraine. Tactical nuclear weapons have an important history. Where we are today often is regarded as unknown territory. When it comes to tactical nukes, we've been here before, and we can look to a future where we can manage tactical nuclear weapons. However, right now there's a book that was published in 2012 that is both prescient and helpful to understand what was and what is. I welcome Colonel Jeff McCausland, CBS News, my colleague at CBS News. He is also Diamond Six Leadership and Strategy and professor, visiting professor at Dickinson College. But right now he's one of the authors and editors of Tactical Nuclear Weapons and NATO. Jeff, a very good evening to you. Thank you for this. I begin with a history of tactical nuclear weapons. And my quick definition is low yield, short range. It gets more tactical than that. Uh, however, that's enough for this question. In 1949, Omar Bradley, a distinguished general who was one of the major figures of the Second War, regarded the tactical nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal as stabilizing. He believes that it was for to favors the defense. Stabilizing is not a word that we would associate with nuclear weapons anywhere in the world. What was the mindset in 1949? Good evening to you, Jeff. Good evening, John. Well, in 1949, I think the mindset began with many people still thinking of nuclear weapons as just a larger form of firepower. You may recall our discussions about Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and many of them thought about it in those particular terms. Second of all, by 1949, with the advent of NATO, there was a recognition that NATO, the United States, and its allies were going to be unlikely to mount sufficient conventional forces to equal what was being put forward by the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. And it was that force disparity that was thought to be destabilizing. So that's when we move forward the decision to develop so-called tactical nuclear weapons as a fire break or as to make up for the difference in our shortfalls in tanks, artillery, conventional, conventional warfare, and began producing uh, such weapons to, in fact, stabilize that particular situation. That situation quickly descended into the Korean War. NATO imagined itself having to field 96 divisions and or use tactical nuclear weapons to secure the battlefield. I learned from your book, Jeff, that Stalin lacked, as late as 52 lacked tactical nuclear weapons. They were not part of the Soviet arsenal. So that did give an advantage to the NATO forces. That's true. And, and many people saw it as a mechanism, again, to stave off that heavy armor advance that the Soviets might conduct. It's important, though, to realize what we're talking about here. As you said, limited in range, limited in yield. Uh, but if one examines the Hiroshima bomb, for example, the Hiroshima bomb was about 15 kiloton. Well, in our present day jargon, and even jargon, or analysis back in 1949, 15 kilotons would still be considered a tactical weapon and not even a strategic weapon based on its yield, of course. Um, early on, the United States uh, developed a 280 millimeter cannon, huge thing. It had to be pulled by one truck and pull, pushed by another truck or track vehicle rather to get it into position. And over time, as the Soviets tried to catch up, we saw a lot of mirror imaging, I think, in the creation of these respective arsenals. The Soviets actually created a 420 millimeter self-propelled howitzer to kind of describe what that looked like. That would be a Navy 16 inch gun on a track vehicle. Proust Joff in his memoirs actually wrote about this particular weapon that it quote, proved the smallness of the military mind. And many people believe that, I'm sorry, some intel reports that when the Soviets tested it, it exploded on several occasions, killed about half the crew. So they restricted these weapons only for use in May Day parades in the 1960s and early 1970s. But as far as being really a weapon of operational utility, it had very, very little value. Everything changed in 1953, the concept of massive retaliation. At that point, I learned the U.S. had an arsenal of 1,000 nukes. The Atomic Energy Commission that was making nuclear weapons, for heaven's sakes, Jeff, that was 10% of the budget of the federal government went into making nuclear weapons. We were manufacturing them quick. What was the vision of massive retaliation? How did that suit with the tactical nuclear weapon? Well, this all fits in the overall scheme of deterrence. And the whole idea was that a Soviet attack anywhere 
would be responded with a massive response by U.S. strategic systems, if you will, holding Soviet cities at hostage. And that would then, therefore, of course, deter that particular attack from ever coming. But over time, as we move in the later 50s and get into the 1960s, we th see the Soviet Union quickly expanding its own strategic arsenal. So at the tactical level, now these particular weapons were that were that fire break that had a couple of then perhaps missions. One was to slow that offensive down, like I mentioned before. And number two, serve as a signal that we are now going to escalate to larger and larger weapon systems in hopes of bringing this particular conflict to a close. And finally, I think uh, this demonstrated a certain degree of competition amongst the services. Clearly, the, the Air Force and the Navy had very clear missions in the area of nuclear weapons. The Navy had nuclear submarines and even were putting some nuclear weapons on, on surface ships, nuclear torpedoes, et cetera. The Air Force, of course, had bombers, had land-based ICBMs. So they had a nuclear mission. So I think some of this was, you know, competition in the services and the Army looking for a nuclear world and created the so-called Pentomic Division, which was based on a concept of integrating nuclear weapons at the tactical level for use in ground operations. And from that, we saw a plethora of weapons being created, um, tactical nuclear weapons for artillery, 155 and 8-inch in particular, uh, the so-called Davy Crockett, which we can talk more about, my favorite, and a large number of shorter range missiles, which were nuclear capable, the Sergeant, the Corporal, the Honest John, uh, and all those, I think, in some ways, was the Army seeking a nuclear role. The 1950s and 1960s had three crises that re-examined tactical nuclear weapons. I mentioned Korea, the Korea War never concluded. Then we have Berlin, 1960-61, and the Berlin Wall in which the Kennedy administration believed it was going to be overrun at any moment. And then the Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis, unaware, yeah. Washington was unaware, to my understanding, that Russia had deployed tactical nuclear weapons over Guantanamo. I wanted to convent a mention to everyone who thinks that everybody was paranoid. The Russians had a battle plan to use tactical nuclear weapons to blow through West Germany and France and be in Calais in 10 days. And they had that plan all through the 60s. So what we have here is two sides staring at each other, capable of pulling a trigger. So I want to come to the way forward, 1963 to 67. Flexible response. What was that, Jeff? A flexible response was the Kennedy administration coming into office and recognizes that the Soviets had now achieved some level of parity in terms of our strategic nuclear weapons. And therefore, the whole idea that we would conduct a massive response if the Russians or Soviets were to attack us conventionally seemed to lack credibility. And for, so then the, the idea was, well, we're going to create these expanded thinking about tactical nuclear weapons. So we have a flexible response. We, can re we could still respond in a massive style if we decided that was appropriate. We could respond at a tactical level to see if we could halt that particular offensive and perhaps reverse it. And it was this whole idea of flexible response that was important. Now, along the way, of course, uh, these had to be integrated more and more in so-called nuclear sharing with alliances. So a, a large number of our allies who had similar uh, platforms, such as the 155 howitzer or the 8-inch howitzer or some of the aircraft that we had, and we would create custodial detachments whereby the Americans would maintain control of the nuclear weapons and then turn them over, if in time of a crisis, to an allied force who actually were trained for the delivery. And we actually positioned uh, such custodial detachments with the British Army of the Rhine in northern Germany, with the German military, with the Turks, with the Belgiques, with the Dutch, who all had core sectors in West Germany as part of the defense of Germany from a Soviet attack, as well as with the Italians and the Greeks. A near catastrophe in 1983, when the Soviet command was convinced the U.S. was going to launch a sneak attack during the Able Archer exercise of that year. Both sides were shocked at how close they came to pulling a trigger. So what we now remember as a period of perestroika or Gorbachev was a period in which the negotiators on both sides were looking to defang tactical nuclear weapons and strategic, but especially tactical, because there are thousands of them. The, the Soviets had at least 7,000. We didn't have a slight number at this period. So we come to the Conventional Forces Treaty of 1990, following the fall of the Soviet Union. 
I'll end there with the history. What did conventional forces have to do with tactical nuclear weapons after the fall of the Soviet? Well, what it had to do with is we negotiated that, and I was heavily involved in that. And it, and it limited several categories of military hardware on the Warsaw Pact side, as well as on the NATO side. And those were tanks, artillery, armored troop carriers, combat helicopters, and attack aircraft. Well, a number of those platforms are dual capable. Again, the 155 howitzer that I'm most familiar with from my army time, or the 8-inch howitzer, uh, is designed primarily to deliver conventional munitions, as we see 155s doing very regularly in Ukraine right now but also is designed to fire a nuclear weapon. So in a, any limitation on the number of platforms, number of artillery pieces you could have in a particular designated area was also going to limit your tactical nuclear capability. Same is true for some of our tactical aircraft. And that is how these two kind of overlap a conventional treaty, which had implications for the ability for one side or the other to deliver tactical nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union falls, and we stop there with our history of tactical nuclear weapons, because as of the end of the Soviet Union, it appeared that the great number that were stored in the Russian side and in the NATO side were no longer necessary. We were going to work together. The ideology that had frightened America and the West for the balance of the 20th century was gone, except when we come back, the NATO posture after 92 what is global zero? This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm speaking to Colonel Jeff McCausen, the one of the authors and editors of Tactical Nuclear Weapons and NATO. We come to the period following the fall of the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation reinvention. A man named Yeltsin is president, and yet the numbers of tactical nuclear weapons on the Russian sides remain very high. We're going to first speak to NATO's ambition. NATO has, at this point, I believe, 28 members. Uh, and those 28 members, maybe less, the number has moved around since the end of the Soviet Union, have to agree about policy. And NATO had a policy called deterrence and defense posture review that was very important to them. The White House, eventually, under Barack Obama, had a policy of global zero between DDP, PR and Global Zero, there was a lot of talk among our allies. And Jeff, we need to attend to our allies here because NATO at this point was understood as a glue of a very successful defense strategy. The Soviets go away. So does the glue still work? And one of the salient points I learned from your, uh, your presentation in this book is that NATO sees nuclear weapons policy, especially tactical nuclear weapons, as a way of holding NATO together, as a form of Atlanticism. Do I say that correctly, Colonel? No, I think that's correct, John. But of course, the question was deterring what? And if the Russian Soviet Union had gone away, was Russia still a threat? And that raised a lot of disquiet in NATO about how many of these particular weapons we needed to have. Europeans, for a long period of time, had had you know, mixed feelings in many places about nuclear weapons on their territory. And one important thing that we only touched on slightly was the whole intermediate nuclear forces disagreement when the Russians uh, created a, an SS-20 missile and as a response, the United States deployed the uh, Pershing-2 and the ground launch cruise missiles in the 1980s. Massive demonstrations in many of our allied countries against that. Those, those particular weapons were eliminated by a treaty called the INF Treaty between uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, which the Trump administration recently abrogated. At the end of the Cold War as well, you had a thing called the PNI, the Presidential Nuclear Initiative. And this was individual actions by both President Bush and President Gorbachev. It was an interesting agreement. It wasn't a treaty. It was just parallel action on both sides to dramatically reduce the tactical nuclear weapons in Europe. The United States went down to about 500. Uh, those all gravity bombs to be delivered by short-legged airplanes but still having weapons positioned in Germany, Holland, Belgium, uh, Italy, and Turkey. And the Russians also reducing their stockpile significantly, but clearly not anywhere close to ours. They still maintained a large number. And their argument was sort of the reverse of what we had argued about in the early part of the NATO days. That they needed to maintain these tactical weapons against a hedge, against what they viewed as a far more powerful now NATO conventional force, that might someday, sometime, threaten the Russian Federation. 
Yes, let's look at our allies. First, the French, I learned, were sensitive to any weakening of nuclear posture. Very, very sensitive. The Germans, on the other side, insisted that arms control take the lead, not building weapons. And then our Central and Eastern members of NATO and those aspiring to be members of NATO remained during the 1990s exceedingly suspicious of Russia and Moscow, uh, the, having to do with centuries of conflict, not just the Cold War. And to knit all these things together is impossible. So what we have here is the allies disagree about the tactical nuclear weapon. And I take it that continued through the 90s into the 21st century, Kerr. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, the French, of course, like the British, created their own strategic nuclear, their own independent strategic nuclear forces. And the French in particular, because for a long period of time, they were not part of the NATO military wing, created their own tactical nuclear forces. We know that they created a tactical warhead for a shorter range of missile called the Pluton. There was some discussion, I know, in the French uh, military uh, during the 1980s, for example, of perhaps miniaturization down to creating a, an artillery shell that could fire a nuclear weapon. So the French were always very independent in their thinking, the force de frappe, that France would have an independent decision on escalation to use nuclear weapons. And then secondly, if you're right about the Germans, the Germans even insisted on when we started talking about deployment of intermediate nuclear forces, INF forces, to counter the, the uh, Soviet SS-20, uh, they demanded a so-called two-track decision, that we would go down two tracks in parallel. One would be a modernization and expansion of the forces available to NATO. That was ground-launched cruise missiles in Pershing II. But that was only going to be acceptable to Germany, who's going to host a large number of these weapons on their territory, if we had an arms control of negotiation in parallel. 30 seconds, Colonel. So, so what, we, what we have here is a moving story into the 21st century. And Global Zero is where this book in 2012 ends. Is there a quick definition of Global Zero? Or do we take it up with the Soviet? Well, the Global Zero is the whole idea of eliminating the possibility of nuclear weapons, which has been a large number of countries uh, have seen that as a goal. There's an ongoing... Uh, effort by particularly countries in the third world to ban all nuclear weapons in an agreement, which still has not gotten ratified. So it was an aspiration, but it was an aspiration during a period of time when we hoped that the Russian Federation and the West would find some accommodation. And sadly, we all know with the invasion of Ukraine in 2022, that possibility is gone. Tactical nuclear weapons in NATO, Colonel Jeff McCausen, when we come back, the Russian point of view. The book was published in 2012 during the Obama administration first term before the election. There was at that time advanced by President Obama a concept called Global Zero, moving towards all nuclear weapons to be ground into plowshares. However, the Soviets, succeeded by the Russians, succeeded by Yeltsin Russians, succeeded by Putin Russians, have consistent objections, whether they were the Soviet state or the Russian state. The first is the objection, if we're going to change our posture towards our nu tactical nuclear weapons, the U.S. must withdraw all of its tactical nuclear weapons from its allies, all of them. And at this point, that would have meant France and, Brit and Britain, but also the five nuclear states, nuclear armed states, that Jeff keeps reminding me of because I can never remember the list, Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Turkey. All five had weapons stored in their a, a sovereign territory at one point during the Cold War, and the Russians insisted they withdraw those weapons. We've already talked about how that uh, those weapons are a way of gluing together the NATO alliance because it's credibility to protect individual states. The Russian demand, however, was adamant. And as I understand, Jeff, that Russian demand was also based on the Russian, the Moscow concept of vulnerability because of the vast territory they must defend. And they see, and then, and still do today, 10 years later, tactical nuclear weapons as their ultimate defense mechanism. Is that correct, Colonel? Yeah, that's correct, John. And also a deterrence mechanism, most, most assuredly. But they talk about it, though, in slightly different terms than they did back when it was the Soviet Union in the 50s and 60s. Back then, they talked about the use of tactical nuclear weapons as part of Soviet military doctrine, 
because the whole idea was to get a heavy armor advance, get it rolling rapidly, blow through the enemy, get into his interior and, and roll him up. And if you got slowed down, then these particular weapons were designed in their mind to blow basically a hole in the defense to get that heavy armor advance back on track. And you can even examine the architecture of their armored vehicles, and you can see they're designed to operate on what we could call a dirty battlefield. In other words, a battlefield that might have not only nuclear weapons being used, but perhaps even chemical weapons. Now, Russian military doctrine uh, talks more about two variants on the use of tactical nuclear weapons. The first is, of course, if in fact uh, the Russians are involved in a conflict and they see themselves losing, they talk about escalating to de-escalate. In other words, moving from the conventional to the tactical nuclear level as a final warning to their adversary, which would be the West, that we're really serious about this and we need, we need to de-escalate this very, very quickly. Otherwise, we're liable to move to central nuclear exchange. The other place they talk about tactical nuclear weapon use is if the Russian state has an existential threat. And that actually gets you some curious things to think about in Ukraine now that Russia has claimed that three provinces of Ukraine are actually Russian territory. The Duma has voted on that. So one could think that if those provinces looked like they were going to fall in total back to the Ukrainians, might that encourage the Russians to, in fact, escalate? So they think about this quite a bit and have maintained these large scale arsenals to do that. The Russians uh, have a vision of the world that is quite profoundly different than that one we have in the US. There are three things the Russians fear uh, for the use of tactical nuclear weapons on the defense, or they believe the offense would use them. The first is a land invasion by NATO through Belarus, through the sensitive to Moscow. They are using tactical nuclear weapons in the way you just said, Colonel, except on the reverse side, blow a hole through defenses and reach Moscow and destroy the apparatus. The second is the U.S. Navy, especially the submarine fleet. The Russians do not believe they have a counter to Navy nuclear mines, Navy nuclear torpedoes, or the use of nuclear weapons off of dual-use aircraft, off of car aircraft carrier groups. They do not see that they have a defense from that, hence they need tactical nuclear weapons. These are the explanations of Russian military writers. I'm looking particularly at a man named Makarov and another man named Litovkin writing mm -hmm. about this in their policy papers. The third way was most intriguing to me, given where we are in the world. They believe they need tactical nukes because of a Russo-Chinese war. How late was that a concept for them, Jeff? 2012? Did they continue that right up until this uh, no limits partnership? Do they still think that way in Moscow? I would think they would have it as a contingency plan, though we now see President Xi and President Putin proclaiming endless friendship. The history of all this suggests that that may be largely transactional. And if you look at, back to the end of the Second World War, we know that uh, the Soviet Union does not declare war on the emperor of Japan, the empire of Japan, until the day after Hiroshima, when they see that this, we're going to win. And they quickly occupy a large piece of territory of what was called Manchukuo, which was a, a Japanese puppet state on the mainland of China, uh, which actually had been Chinese territory taken away from China in the first uh, Japanese-Chinese war in the 1930s. And they've maintained that. And many Chinese writers still argue that's that's Chinese territory. And you'll recall during the Cultural Revolution that there was a grave concern, actually some skirmishes between Soviet and Chinese forces along the Amur River in that particular part of Siberia. And there are even reports during the Nixon administration that the concern that the Soviets had about unrest in, in, uh, in China at that time, that the Soviets were considering some kind of a surgical strike against Lop Nol, which was the Chinese uh, nuclear testing facility, and, and talk to Kissinger and others about how the United States might respond if, in fact, they decided to do that. So I think there's been a lot of concern historically by the Soviets, and I would imagine those war plans are somewhere in the Ministry of Defense this very day. But the Russians are always been concerned about on the Western side and continued even after the end of the Cold War by our maintenance of about 500 warheads amongst the countries that you mentioned, but also the modernization of that, because we've modernized, modernized the warhead, the B-61. And now with the arrival of the F-35 aircraft to all those countries for their custodial use, obviously the F-35 is a radar evasive aircraft, has a lot greater penetrating 
potential. And one of our things in the book that we talked about was at that point in time, 2012, NATO was at a dilemma because the aircraft that many of our country, the countries are using, such as the Buccaneer and some of the older aircraft, particularly for the Germans, they were about to get out of the nuclear business because the aircraft could no longer be seen as viable for that particular mission. And the Russians always said, well, wait a minute, if we're not a threat, why are you still modernizing this force? We would talk about concerns with Iran and other places, which I think made them intentionally or very intentionally suspicious, if not paranoid. Two exercises, military exercises by the Russian forces a decade apart. The first is Zapa 99. That's an attack on Belarus. Yep. And uh, that's the escalate to de-escalate to stop that attack by NATO. But the one that attracted me was Vostok 2010, before the Ukraine conflict. This was a war on the PLA after the collapse of the DPRK. It's striking, Jeff, how they've anticipated all of this. Slightly different combinations, but that's what diplomacy is for. Because in April of 1999, I have a quote from your book. You couldn't have known when you put this in your book. Putin is quoted as saying he authorized, he understands why it's necessary to authorize the utilization of non-strategic nuclear weapons. April of 99, months before Zapad 99 used that. So what we're looking at is not something that Putin came up with for rhetoric. He's not a military man. He's getting this from his general staff that got it from their seniors, that got it from their seniors. This dates back at least 40 years. Do I, do I read that correctly, Colonel? Well, absolutely. This is called integrated military doctrine they've developed over the last 30 or 40 years. And I'm confident if you and I were to go to the Frunza Military Academy, where they where they educate young Russian uh, military officers, there would be a lot of talk about how one integrates mili- uh, nuclear weapons into land combat and land operations as part of overall doctrine. So I think it's just part and parcel of something that's been evolutionary. And then the geopolitical circumstance of the Russian Federation, particularly in the aftermath of the Cold War, suggested to them they were now in a weakened position, potentially against NATO, but also perhaps over time, potentially against China. And how are we going to make up for those differences? We didn't have the material resources to field anything like an army that the Soviet Union had in terms of the number of divisions, et cetera. So these weapons were kept and integrated into thinking as a hedge against those particular possibilities. Slipchenko is the name of the Russian general. I believe he was head of the general staff at one point who talked about sixth generation warfare. And it was translated in 2004 by a man named Alexei Fenenko. I get these details from Jeff's book. Um, The mutually assured destruction uh, policy of the 20th century is regarded as obsolete, obsolete. City City destruction is no longer part of the Russian thinking. And what I take from this is they're more reliant on tactical nuclear weapons here in the 21st century than they ever were in the 20th century. Is that too big a conclusion, General? No, I think it's an absolute total good conclusion, John. And sadly, as we watch the Russian army suffering enormous casualties and the enormous destruction of military hardware in the Ukraine war, just from a standpoint of that particular army, if the war in Ukraine ended today, my estimate would be it would take the Russian army probably 10 years or more just to get to the state it was on the day before they invaded Ukraine. And that, for me, w- brings up the second worry Then it, during that period of time, even if they were in that position, they will become more and more reliant on their tactical nuclear weapons as a hedge as they see their conventional arms being dramatically weakened. So what we have today is the possibility that the Russians are not ignoring their tactical nuclear weapon brigades, but enhancing them. I have a note here that at one point, I believe in the 20th century, it might have been the early 21st, they were looking at developing 10 brigades of Iskander. Uh, Isn't that their short-range artillery piece that delivers nuclear weapons? Uh, No, it's actually a shorter-range missile, John. But when we talk shorter-range missile, it's in relative terms. For example, I'm told from British friends, if you position an Iskander launcher in Kaliningrad, obviously the most western province of the Russian Federation right there on the Baltic Sea, yeah, it can strike m- many, if not most, targets in Great Britain. So it's more, uh, again, uh, you can split hairs on on the different words, more of a theater weapon than a tactical weapon that would be used in direct support of ground operations, but certainly could make that type of a threat 
uh, and they see that again as a matter of deterrence as they perceive their threat growing in the in the in the respect to NATO increasing its forces, while at the same time them losing a lot of their force capabilities in the ongoing struggle in Ukraine. Another one of their military thinkers, Sergei Karan Karaganov, he sees a limited conflict using tactical nuclear weapons preventing a general war. That's the way it's it's positioned in Russian conversation. The reason we have TAC nukes is to prevent the end of the world. Yeah, that fits right into the thinking of so-called escalate to de-escalate. We'll escalate to these weapons, which will prevent then an escalation on both sides, the central nuclear exchange, and frankly, the destruction of both countries. And it also fits in that broader thinking that they've talked about of such weapons being employed if, in fact, there is a threat to the very existence of the Russian Federation. I'm speaking to Colonel Jeff McCausen, CBS News, Diamond Six Leadership and Strategy CEO, visiting Professor Dickinson College. The book is Tactical Nuclear Weapons and NATO. Editors Tom Nichols, Douglas Stewart, and Colonel Jeff McCausen, all of whom have essays, including many more of their colleagues, because tactical nuclear weapon thinking has evolved over these 70, 80 years of the nuclear weapon. And Germany has a position, France has a position, all Poland certainly does, asking for TAC nukes to be based in Poland. When we come back, what is to be done? And Jeff, I it was a puzzle to find something positive out of what all the work that you did 12 years ago to go forward with the, the present tangle. The only thing I could find that made sense to me, again, is to talk about conventional force treaty linked to global zero in some fashion. That didn't happen the first time. Can it happen the second time, Colonel? I think it could possibly, John. It would seem to me in any type of a negotiated settlement, if we expect one to occur, there's liable to be a conventional force element that will mimic many of the things that we talked about in the conventional forces Europe negotiations. Because again, the Russians feeling very exposed on the conventional side, we want some reassurances that that large scale conventional assault from the United States uh, and this NATO lie is not uh, going to occur. And this was one of the goals of CFE back during the Cold War, it was to prevent the sudden uh, bolt out of the blue attack by one side against the other. We saw that actually integrated as well in other agreements. For example, the Dayton Accords that were that ended the conflict in the, in the Balkans has a conventional arms control component, which looks very similar in structure to the CFE treaty in terms of what systems it limits, and this is to keep us, you know, security uh, and, and the prospects of avoiding future conflict down between Bosnia, Croatia, and Serbia. So I think it's very possible. Uh, secondly, of course, along the way in the Cold War, we created certain institutions that could be valuable in that post-Ukraine war type of a world. The Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, which oversaw a lot of the CFE negotiations and also has other agreements which are still intact, but I think not used very often, such as the Vienna document, which allows both sides to allow observers if in fact they're going to do large military exercise above certain thresholds. And finally, I think uh, I was a bit disappointed, frankly, when the uh, Trump administration uh, withdrew from the Open Skies Agreement, which I thought uh, obviously was not a panacea, but again, provided some measure of transparency between both sides which in time of crisis, hopefully would dampen things down. What was Open Skies, Jeff? Define it for the audience. Oh, Open Skies was an agreement between us and the Soviet Union and others, the Russian Federation, uh, that allowed both sides to announce they were going to conduct an aerial uh, overflight of territories in the United States, territories in the Russian Federation, to monitor activities, particularly with existing nuclear forces. And these were all pre-announced uh, exercises. Aircraft would come over, they'd fly those routes, they'd be accompanied by people from our uh, on-site inspection agency, and the the film and photograph from those particular aerial overflights would become immediately uh, unclassified and then could be shared with all the signatories to that particular treaty. So I thought it was a particularly useful device. Actually, it was initially discussed by Dwight Eisenhower when he was president uh, in the late 1950s as a measure to reduce the possibility of escalation and was brought into being uh, during the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush. In 2012, when you and your colleagues published this book and all of your contributors uh, were a, a great detail to do the history, China was not part of the story. 
It was a different world then. Hu Jintao had just uh, passed on the baton to Xi Jinping. Now China is part of this nuclear uh, matrix that we're existing. Uh, to your knowledge, is China, does this create the same problem we have with Russia, tactical nuclear weapons are a Chinese favorite? I don't know. I've not read anything about their tactical nukes. We have, seen about, great, we have about one minute, Jeff. Yeah, I have not seen a great deal in open source intelligence, John, about the Chinese moving forward in the development of tactical nuclear weapons. They seem more focused on trying to develop strategic nuclear forces, which will be roughly equal to that of the United States. And while the Trump administration insisted that future nuclear strategic discussions could not continue unless China participated, well, the Chinese have pretty much indicated they're not willing to do that until they reach that level of parity. But there are a couple other countries that have created such weapons that are worrisome. North Korea obviously continues to expand its nuclear arsenal, and there are certain reports that they may also be thinking about tactical weapons. And finally, we know the government of Pakistan has created an arsenal of about 170 to 180 nuclear weapons and have actually uh, developed some short-range so-called battlefield nuclear weapons systems, the, the a missile called the Nasser, uh, which only has a range of about 60 kilometers to try to stave off a large-scale advance of Indian forces. So unfortunately, we see a bit of proliferation of these ideas and corresponding weapons around the world. I thank Colonel Jeff McCausen, one of the editors and authors of Tactical Nuclear Weapons in NATO. I'm John Batchelor.